Hi, my name's Sam, and I'm here to talk to you about some of the theorists that we need to understand in order to develop our pedagogical theories, which form our foundations in the classroom. The first theorist I'm going to talk to you about is Lev Vygotsky. Lev Vygotsky was born in 1896 in Belarus, and he studied in Moscow to become a psychologist during the time of the Russian Revolution. The focus of the Russian Revolution hinged on a broken bond between the Russian Tsar and the autocracy and the people of Russia who felt like there was a power imbalance and needed to feel represented. The country was in the middle of a massive World War I effort and failed to respond with military might. There was a massive economic upheaval and people were losing trust in their government. There was a process of overthrowing the autocratic government by the left socialist revolutionaries and the Bolshevik party. And this left a lot of intellectuals looking for new ways to learn about the world, connect with the world, and see themselves as part of the power structure. And this is when Vygotsky was finding himself being educated in the studies of psychology. Questions to consider. What does this have to do with Vygotsky? Why does knowing the cultural background of a theorist help us to understand their theories a little bit better? It's really important for us to understand the cultural context that surrounds the way that we think and the new ideas that we come up with. Vygotsky was living in a time when there was a lot of upheaval in the intellectual community looking at new ways psychology might apply to children and youth, and this extends into education as well. Emerging from his studies in psychology, Vygotsky was really focused on the psychological environment of children and how the social connections that they made impacted the way that they learn. But Vygotsky was in opposition to the current idea of the time that children just spontaneously grew and developed. Instead, he believed that children were prompted to development through the social connections that they made with the world around them. He believed that growth doesn't just happen. Instead, it is a product of their learning environment that they're actively a part of. This is called sociocultural theory. Questions to consider. Can you think of a time in your life when growth just happened? Or can you think of a time in your life when you were supported to learn something new? Aside from our own physical growth, as humans, everything we learned is usually supported by another person. Think about when you first learned to tie your shoes or ride a bike or cook a steak or learn how to do the quadratic equation. Very typically, someone comes alongside us and supports us in learning our new skill or piece of knowledge. Because Vygotsky believed that growth did not just come to a child spontaneously, he theorized that the child's environment and social interactions had an important role to play in developing a student's learning. This includes their teachers, their educators, their fellow students, and their social environment. This is called cultural historical theory. Children take in information from their environment, convert it into a social memory, apply it to the knowledge that they already have, and then build the understanding or skill that they need to learn. This means that we as educators have a role in the classroom to ensure that we understand the students' background knowledge and are giving them support to get to the next thing that they need to learn. This means that us as teachers need to understand the child's knowledge limitations and where it ends and how we're going to take them to the next stage in learning. This gap, this space between what a child already knows and what a child needs to learn is called the zone of proximal development. In a diagram, it might look like this. This is the space where the child has gained knowledge, a space where the child needs to expand their knowledge and the distance between these two events. The child has skills that are on the edge of emergence, as in they're almost able to do the next set of skills or acquire the set of knowledge that they need, but they have to have assistance in order to get there. This is not child specific. This is about us as learners and people. What do you know right now and what do you need to know in order to get to the next piece of information you'd like to gain? Would you like to learn how to play piano? Do you know how to read sheet music? How will you gain the support from the people around you in order to get to where you want to go, which is playing the piano? Vygotsky theorized that it's the responsibility of the educator in that social environment to bridge the gap between the knowledge that the student already has and the knowledge that they need to learn in order to get to their next stage of development. You may stand at the front of a classroom and teach all of the new information that you like, but that student may not understand the information if you don't give them the skills and the tools that they need to get there. Although he never did use the word, educators now call this scaffolding. Scaffolding is the piece of equipment that construction builders use in order to raise a house or a bridge to a higher level. It's removable, we build it, we stand on it, we build to the next level, and we take it away. This is exactly what we do in the classroom by providing our students with the supports that they need to get to the next level of their learning. The child then needs the environment to practice those skills in a social context to imitate you as the modeler, the teacher, and then to use those skills in their own learning. At different stages of development, Vygotsky believed that there were different methods that we could do to bridge a student from one piece of learning to the next. At the preschool age, 
play as the best method of development that he theorized was great for children. As children grew up, it was the use of language in social environments that supported children from going from one stage of learning to the next. This is done by imitating the language that we hear and trying to use it in appropriate contexts. For example, in a science lesson, if you just randomly start throwing out scientific language like hypothesis to a student who's never learned it, they don't actually know how to apply the hypothesis that they have, even though they might have a hypothesis. In conversation, we can help students understand the language of hypothesis by saying, I think, I guess, I assume that this will happen. And then we can analyze our hypothesis. I was correct, I was incorrect, I was totally way off base. And we can help students understand when they might apply a hypothesis and when it's appropriate to use that language. Working in a social context together, they can imitate us as educators. Now in 2021, this information seems pretty obvious. We know that children need support to get from one piece of knowledge to the next. That's why we have our modern schooling system. Students have 504s and IEPs. We understand the different sets of needs and accommodations and modifications that students need. The idea of a zone of proximal development development is just as important as ever. No matter who the child is, their zone of proximal development might look differently between one student and the next. As teachers, it's our responsibility to look at each set of students and understand their background knowledge, how to apply it, and how we might support them, and giving them appropriate scaffolding that they may use. One student may need more scaffolding than another student, but we need to make sure that we have it all prepared to be able to support them. Question to consider, can you think of some scaffolding methods that you may use or already use in your classroom? To put this into practice, we're going to look at a grade three social studies standard from the Ontario curriculum and pair it with an ELA standard from the grade three Ontario curriculum to see how we can have those two programs working together and offer scaffolding for students. Social studies standard A1.3 says, identify some key components of the Canadian identity, like bilingualism, multiculturalism, founding nations, religious freedom, and describe some of the ways in which communities, heritage, and identity that were in Canada around the early 1800s have had an impact on Canadian identity, with reference to Canada's official languages, cultural contributions, place names, observances. The ELA standard we'll use is 1.6, extend understanding of texts by connecting the ideas in them to their own knowledge and experience, to other familiar texts, and to the world around them. Some students may land on their own zone of proximal development in different ways. They may know that they're immigrants to Canada, or residents of Canada, or citizens of Canada, or any combination of those. They may know that they live in the province of Ontario. They may know the name of their own municipality or city leaders, or they may not. Students may understand different languages or know the root words in multicultural, like multi or bi, and bicultural, but we need to be able to support those students understanding and assuming that they may or may not have that knowledge, and we need to activate their background knowledge in a classroom. We can support students in achieving these standards by connecting their cultural identity now as Canadians or residents of Canada to their Canadian history and understanding how this impacts our identity today by doing a few of these things in the classroom. We might introduce an ELA concept by activating vocabulary such as the meaning of the words identity, heritage, root words such as multi or bi like in multilingual or bilingual. We may apply these to words we're familiar with like multiplayer games or bicycle for example. We can provide students with a word wall that they might reference when they're writing a piece of reflection. We might provide students with a dictionary that has words highlighted that it will be important to learning this content. We can offer word banks. We might introduce visual cues like pictures, primary sources to support students with seeing images about what our current identity is as Canadians and compare these with visual cues to understand what early Canadian settler life looked like. We might scaffold learning by giving students an opportunity to use the language that they've learned in class, having conversations about identity or heritage, sharing their own family stories from their family or community who speak different languages. We might provide students with a YouTube video or a website that provides some different cultural heritage background information for Canadian students. We can give students different levels of scaffolding to help them support their knowledge and make sure that all students are able to move to the next zone of proximal development. The importance of understanding sociocultural theory and the zone of proximal development is realizing that as an educator in the system that we're in, we have a role to bridge students' knowledge from what they already understand and the edge of emergence to the next skill and set of knowledge that they need to gain. By providing them with a system of scaffolding that is intentional and really specific to the needs of our classroom. Our role as teachers is to look at the unique needs of the kids in our classroom and meet them by providing them with as many opportunities for learning and growing as possible. Some students may not need all of the scaffolding. Some students may need none of it and some students may need all of it. But we need to ensure that we're providing as much opportunity in the classroom for students to learn and grow together by providing them with every single resource and opportunity that we can gather. 
Building a really good system of scaffolding is so important to developing strong lesson plans and helping our students grow. Thank you so much for joining with me today to learn about Lev Vygotsky and the zone of proximal development, especially as it relates to us in the classroom as teachers.